Hi everyone, welcome back to DPRIO TV, and Priya Tawalji has returned for the second episode of Season 3. If you don't remember what we talked about last time, we talked about the building blocks of biology, which that's what the theme for this season is, and this time we're continuing with Season 2, The Variety of Life. This episode, however, will not have one turn, will not have two turns, but a record-breaking 19 turns in the entire thing. We have 19 terms to go through, so let's get this gone. Also, at the end of the video, I will announce a new gaming series that's going to take place of Ani that's leaving. We're going to do another gaming series, so I'll make that announcement at the end. So, yeah, let's get started with our 19 terms. Alright, so like always that we do at the beginning of our videos, we review the key terms. Okay, here we go. Our 19 key terms today, we have bacteria, virus, protists, fungus, seedless plants, conifers, flowering plants, invertebrates, jellies, Worms, anthropods, insects, mollusks, starfish, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Okay, we should probably start getting this going, so first term, let's go. Alright, so our first of 19 terms is bacteria. We all pretty much know what bacteria is, but these are prokaryotic cells, or prokaryotes. We learned last time what a prokaryote is. It's an animal with a single cell. So, yeah, these are small prokaryotes. These things can survive in almost any inhospitable condition in the world, like literally any. From like buried two miles underground to living in literal nuclear waste. So basically these things can be super resistant. These animals, however, can create some of the world's worst diseases. So like some of the worst diseases in history, for example, the Black Death, I think, was carried by the rats, which had fleas, which had the bacteria, which infected and killed two-thirds of Europe. Black Death, E. coli, I think malaria is also in there. So yeah, some of the worst diseases in the world. Fun fact, the reproduction rate of bacteria is about 28,000 copies a day, so that is a lot. So you can see how they spread pretty easily. Alright, second term, virus. If you don't know what a virus is, well, we've been living in a virus caused pandemic. For those of you watching in the future, we are right now in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, so yeah, that's the time period which this is being feared, filmed in. Okay, anyway, viruses are rogue packages of DNA or RNA, so basically, you know like the virus with like the case and that has a little spike sticking out? There's a piece of DNA inside, so basically it's evil DNA that invades cells, and then when it invades the cell, it makes it use its resources for it. So basically it like mind controls the cell to do whatever it wants for it. These viruses can't reproduce, eat, or grow by themselves. They cannot do it by themselves, that's why they invade the cells to do it. So that's why when you get sick, they invade your cells and then they use your resources to spread and multiply. The immune system is really the thing that defends your body from viruses. The T cell is one of the immune system uh, particles or bodies that is in charge of destroying viruses. So basically it hunts them down and then destroys them. Fun fact about them, um, the number of known viruses in the world, including COVID-19, is about 5,000. So that's a lot. All right, turn number three of 19, protists. I forgot to put an S there. Protists. All right. These are prokaryotic organisms, like we learned last time, single-celled. They're, they're kind of similar to bacteria, so they're kind of like bacteria's cousin in a way. These things are kind of like a combination. They're neither plant nor animal, so they're kind of like somewhere in between. These things use mitochondrial ribosomes, which we learned last time. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell that supply the energy with ATP. Ribosomes are the protein factories, which make proteins for the cell, which also give it energy and, and for its supplies. So that's what it has in its cell, because it's a single cell. Protists, you may also know them by amoeba, protozoans, or algae is probably the number one one you, the, probably the most common one you know, you know, when you're in your pool and then weird green stuff starts to grow. That is algae. Try to clean it because it gets everywhere. Fun fact, the average size of a protist is about 0.01 to 0.5 millimeters, so incredibly small, which is pretty accurate. Well, it's not pretty accurate, just pretty expectable. All right, turn number four of 19, fungus. We pretty much all know what fungus is. Mushrooms is usually the thing it's occurred with. They are organisms that can usually be found in decaying things, so things that are decomposing or rotting, that either fungus can be usually found. They can also be used to make antibiotics, like vaccines and stuff. If you heard of penicillin, 
or penicill, penicillin. It comes from a fungus called penicillium. That also, that helps with antibiotics, which are a life-saving cure. Some fungus, if you find a mushroom in the forest, don't eat it. Some mushrooms can be lethal to eat. I forget what the name of the mushroom is, but if you eat it, you start like hallucinating and then you're just like, oh, I feel tired. And then, well, you're, you're, you're kind of gone by then. And they're also in charge of disposal, so there, there's also an organelle in the, in the cell called the lysosome. That kind of sounds like ribosome. Lysosomes are kind of like the disposal part. They get rid of worn out organelles or garbage that accumulates and then just decompose them with enzymes. That is kind of like what the fungus does. It decomposes rotting waste and just disposes of it. Fun fact, this is a good one actually. The largest fungus in the world is the honey mushroom. This can be up to 9 million square meters, square miles, no, nine, 97, 9 million square meters, or 97 square, 97 million square feet. That is a lot. That's basically like covering like an entire field, I think. It's like something like that. All right, next term. This next three terms are all gonna be about plants. So this is where we're getting into our plant session. We'll get more into plants later in the season. Seedless plants. These plants, as you can tell, are ones that are seedless. Yeah, that's kind of obvious, obviously. So these ones, you're wondering, oh, how do they spread themselves? These things use spores to spread themselves. These are also believed to be the first plants on the earth because the earth, probably when it was created, did not have seeds already, so these plants were probably the first one to pop up. These ones use something of chemical called chlorophyll. We'll talk about more about that later when we talk about more about plants. These use, the chlorophyll is kind of like the plant version of the mitochondria. They do the exact same thing. They use sugar, sunlight, and water to make energy for the cell. These group, these consist of mosses, ferns, and seaweeds. Those are some examples of some seedless plants. And as you can see, these can usually be found near shores, near the ocean. Fun fact, the fastest growing seaweed, which is a type of seedless plant, is called the giant kelp. 3.3 feet per day it grows, or one meter per day. That's like about, um, that's like, that's about three feet. I don't know if you can see it because of the camera, but that's a pretty big distance for a day. Sorry if this video is going to be a bit long because as you can see we have a lot of terms and I'm trying to go by every term as fast but we're going to have to make do with what we have. Conifers is our second plant term. Conifers are evergreen trees that can be some of the longest living things in the world. So conifers is an example, a pine tree or the regular Christmas tree that you have every year. Christmas is coming up though. Happy fall, by the way. I haven't even said that yet. I don't think so. Special leaves on the tree, so like little bristles of leaves on a Christmas tree that you usually see allow it to live in cold conditions. That's why those trees are usually sorted with the winter. Parts of these conifers can help it adapt to multiple conditions. So the roots and the trunk are usually for stability because of the winds during the winter, the trees, cold conditions to help it retain energy, and a bunch of other parts. We'll talk about plants more later. Fun fact about conifers, the tallest conifer in the entire world, or the tallest species of conifer, is called the coast redwood. I'm guessing it's in California. I think that's where a lot of the conifers are located, also in the north. The coast redwood can be up to 378 feet tall or 115.2 meters. That is massive. I don't know how would you climb that. All right, term seven of 19. Let's keep going. Flowering plants. We talked about seedless plants. Now we're gonna talk about the flowering plants. This is our last of our plant terms for today. These are plants that we see basically almost everywhere. If you've seen it in our backyard, we have a lemon tree. I think you've seen it probably in an older video, but we have a lemon tree in our backyard and that produces pollen, flowers, and fruit, which are those, those are the three characteristics that flowering plants produce. They also have, I think it's called uh, symbiotic, I think so, symbiotic relations. Symbiotic relations with bees, so the bees are like, hey, the bees get the pollen, and then they feed their high, and then they also give nutrients, I think, to the plants, which so, it's a win-win relationship. These are usually colorful, as hence the name flowering plants. So these have plants, so these have flowers, very colorful flowers, year-round, seasonal. So some of the mass-produced foods, so like everyday food that we have, like rice, wheat, and corn, come from flowering plants. Like I said, they produce stuff, unlike seedless plants, which don't produce stuff. Fun fact, the largest flowering plant, let's see if I can see this See this right, Eucalyptus amygdalina. Eucalyptus amygdalina. It's 410 feet tall and one or 125 meters tall. All right, let's move on to the next term. All right, this is where we start getting into our animal section. The rest of the terms are animal terms. So we are on term eight of 19, where we are making good progress. We're almost halfway there. Okay, 
Invertebrates. This is a term that's going to pop up the rest of the episode, so you want to pay attention. Invertebrates are the opposite of vertebrates, which means invertebrates have no backbone, so no spine. We are vertebrates, us humans are vertebrates because we got the spine in the back. These may have actually been the first animals to live on Earth if the theory proves right eventually. So most of these most of these animals and vertebrates consist of insects, worms, and a category of animals called arthropods. We will talk about them turn 11, which is not far. Fun fact about invertebrates, we're moving by fast. The highest jumper, these invertebrates usually consist of insects. When you think of them, they are mostly insects. And highs, the highest jumper, the one that can jump the highest, is the spittle bug. I think that's what it's called. 70 times its height. That is massively big. So I need to find out how big it is to try to see how to compare it. Okay, turn number nine. We're almost into the 10. We're almost out, done with 10 terms. All right, jellies. You, always, you would obviously think jellyfish, but no. Jellies do not just include jellyfish. They also include coral and anemone, anemone, anemones. Goodness me, why does it take so hard to, t to say? These are pretty strange creatures. They have no eyes, they have no brains, and they have no heart. So, yeah, you can see how pretty weird these things are. The 80%, well, these things are actually 90% water, so you can expect how that would be weird as well. These creatures are usually bioluminescent. They, preserve, they can have a property called bioluminescence. You can, if you haven't seen that before, it's like some of the creatures that live in the dark dips of the ocean or some land creatures, they glow at night using some special bacteria, which we learned about first term. So these things have bioluminescence, so they can go off the dark to scare predators or to intimidate their prey to get the prey. Fun fact about these, there are 9,000 different species of jelly, so that include jellyfish, coral anemone, and anemones, and way other, other, much other species besides that. All right, we have reached term number 10, which means we only have nine terms to go. We're making good progress. Worms, we talked about them when we talked about invertebrates two terms ago. Worms are a type of invertebrate, like I just said. They include leeches, tapeworms, earthworms, so basically some pretty nasty creatures. They're kind of gross in my opinion. They're divided into three classes or three groups, so there's three types of worms. There's segmented worms, round worms and flat worms. I have no idea which worm fits into which category, but I just know those are the three classes. Fun fact, I know this term went by pretty fast. Longest worm in the world, the longest species of worm, is called the Nemertian. Nemertian, yeah. It can be up to 164 feet long. Imagine if you see that thing crawling in your house, that'd be terrifying, or in the ground. 50 meters is the equivalent of that. All right, so our 11th term, this was mentioned a bit earlier, arthropods. Arthropods are very special animals that have something called an exoskeleton. That means that instead of having their skeleton on the inside, they have their, well, instead of having their backbone on the inside, they have it on the outside of their body. That'd be kind of weird if your spine was on the outside of your body, so above your skin. This would include some insects, some sp spiders, scorpions, and some crustaceans like lobsters and crabs. These animals can have from a measly six limbs to over 200 limbs like centipedes, or a type of uh, arthro arthropod, that's a hard word to say, so plus 200 limbs, that's a lot. Fun fact about arthropods, the smallest arthropod is called the, oh well, let's see if I can pronounce this. Areophyid, Areophyid? Areophyid mite. It's a mite, so it's kind of like a little flea insect. These can be up to 0 0.06 inches. Inches. Oh, I put it wrong. I think that's supposed to say 0 0.06 inches, and the other's supposed to say 0 0.15 millimeters. Bro apologies about that. I'll fix that next time. Uh, my notes are right here. If I have my notes on the computer right here, so that's how I'm able to, if sometimes if I look down, that's mean I'm looking at my notes. All right, we need to finish with the terms. All right, term number 12 of 19, we have seven terms left after this. Insects, we have mentioned them a lot recently. Insects are six-legged arthropods. We learned what an arthropod is. They're exos animals with an exoskeleton, so on the outside of their body. Three-fourths of the world's living thing population, three-fourths of the world's animal population are insects, so that is a massive amount. Insects can live in almost any environment, really. They are 
pretty resilient to a lot of things. The growth process for an insect, so when they're little larvae, like little little jelly bean sized, they grow pretty fast and then they start the mating process, which we're not gonna get that deep into that because we all know what happens. All right, the fun fact about them is that the heaviest insect in the world is called the giant weta. The giant weta, it's 2.5 ounces, which not may not seem by a lot, but it's 70 grams, which is a lot, 2.5 weight ounces. I'm not the good at the English system, I'm more of a metric system kind of guy. All right, term number 13. Mollusks. Mollusks are pretty interesting animals. They include snails, oysters, clams, mussels, octopuses, octopi, I think that's how you say, and squid. Those are in the mollusk family. Well, a lot of these things, most of them carry a protective shell around them. So if you think of a snail, they have a shell around them for protection. Clams, oysters, a lot of those things have a shell around them to keep protection. They collect food with like a jar, a sharp, jagged little part of their body called a rad, radula, radula, so they kind of like, um, say, uh, I'm gonna get one of the plants here, say this is their food, this little plant, they like grab it like that and then here, they have the food right there. Fun fact about mollusks, the deadliest mollusk, which this is an animal like, no, don't mess with them like no this is i beg you i actually restrict you from touching this animal please do not touch it it's called the blue ringed octopus if you have never seen it before do not touch it it is deadly as mackerel all right 14th term i think yes 14th term we're almost done we got five terms to go after this starfish as you know starfish usually is a thing of starfish like star on the beach yes but the starfish, it's a family of animals. They usually include starfish, which you know, sea urchins and sea cucumbers and a bunch of others more. These are like a skeleton made of calcium because all skeletons are usually made of calcium. So yeah, that's basically what they are, the little sack of calcium almost. Adult starfish move by using a water pump, so like a water jet. So like, this is your foot, like you can't really see it. Uh, yeah, whatever. But yeah, you get the point. They have little water pumps at their feet for mobility. Little starfish, like baby starfish, use some other technique that I'm not sure of. These usually can be covered in spines, as you know, sea urchins are basically little spiky balls. They do that for defense, so they don't get eaten. Fun fact about starfish, the largest number of arms, the one, the starfish with the biggest amount of arms is called the helicoilaster. Helicoliaster, I think that's what it's called. 50 arms, that is a massive amount. All right, 15th term, we've already done with 15 terms. That's a pretty good amount. We got four to go after this one. Fish, we all pretty know what fish is, like salmon and carps and goldfish and stuff like that, but not the snack. Goldfish, well, I'm getting confused now with the goldfish is snack, I'm hungry. Fish are the largest group of vertebrates in the entire world, which means they have a backbone or a spine almost. They can breathe underwater because they always live underwater. With gills, they have little little flaps here. Like say this is their face, they have little like flaps here that they breathe underwater with. They can basically live in almost any body of water from the freezing Arctic Ocean to the crushing depths of the abyss. Of the abyss. The fun fact is the fastest fish in the world is called the sailfish. It can go over 600 miles. It can go over 600 hundred miles per hour that's faster than a formula one car you know like formula one or a hundred kilometers per over a hundred kilometers per hour that's pretty fast all right term number 16 we're almost done oh i'm getting tired holy mackerel amphibians we pretty much all know what amphibians is they are vertebrates that have so they have the backbone they're cold-blooded which means they don't they need they need energy from somewhere else they can't produce really much their own body heat these include frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, and a bunch of all a bunch of other ones. These things usually live in wet climates, so wet tropical humid climates where they can get the water moisture for their cold bloodedness. -ness -ness. For their cold bloodedness. The offspring, so little tadpoles, are born with gills. So remember we learned in gills, this is the little flaps of skin to help underwater things breathe. And then they grow to have the developed lungs that the adults have. Fun fact about amphibians, the largest frog, which is a type of amphibian, is called the Goliath frog. These can be up to 12 inches in length. This is about a ruler size and also 30 centimeters. I don't know why I put meters there. 30 centimeters in length. These can weigh also a bunch, about, this can weigh also about as much as a pet cat. Like, you know your pet cat at home? 
These can weigh about as much as it, so your cat should kind of be fearful of this. Whew. Okay, we're almost through. Term number 17, let's go. I always like to think of reptiles, which is our next term, as kind of like the cousin of the amphibians, so they're kind of related in some way. Reptiles, they include animals like tur turtles, crocodiles, lizards, snakes, geckos, basically a lot of ones with the scaly dry skin. That's a, that's a common factor among all of them. They also have, the animals that have shells, they have soft waterproof shells, so what usually these animals like to hang out in the water, so they have to have that waterproof skin or shell. Like amphibians, these are cold-blooded, which means they need body heat. They need to produce their own body heat from getting energy from somewhere. And these are also vertebrates, like a lot of the other animals. So like I said, they have to work a lot. So eat a lot, hunt a lot, to get their body heat and functions ready to go because they are cold-blooded. The smallest reptile in the world is the dwarf sphero... The dwarf sphero sphero gecko? The dwarf sphero greco. These can... gecko. This can be up to 0.64 inches or 16 millimeters in diameter. That's about, oh, I don't have it with me, but that's about the size of a marble. Like, about a marble is about that big. So, that's pretty small. We're almost there. Term number 18. This is the second to last term. Okay. Birds, we pretty much already know what birds is. Things that fly in the sky, as you can see from my mark, flying in the sky. These are vertebrate animals, which means they have the backbone, and we know they lay eggs. Eggs are good for breakfast. May, these may have evolved from dinosaurs over the millions of years of evolution that may have happened. These are war-blooded, unlike the ones we just talked about, amphibians and reptiles, which are cold-blooded. So these can make their own body, they, they, can, they can make their own body heat, and they are they have warm, they can have waterproof feathers for water. Their beaks, the beaks that they have, correspond to the food they eat. So some beaks have, uh, some birds have a beak to eat harder foods like nuts, and some have to eat things like seeds or berries or fruits. So their beak corresponds to what they eat, sometimes fish. Not that fish have the beak, but they have, the, sometimes the birds eat fish, so they have that beak for that. These birds like to migrate seasonally, so usually these birds migrate in the winter, so with the winter coming around pretty soon in the northern hemisphere, these seasonal migrations can start happening pretty soon, so they like to do it to a favorable climate. Fun fact, the highest flyer, so the one that can fly the highest, is the Rupel's Griffin Vulture. It's a type of vulture. 36 thousand feet or 11,000 meters. These are usually as high as some planes can fly, so that's pretty high. <sighs> My feet are starting to hurt, but we made it. Term number 19, the final term of this lesson. Here we go. If you stuck around all the way to the end, I say thank you for doing this. Mammals, basically kind of like you and me. Basically, we are mammals. Humans are considered to be mammals. They are covered in fur and usually feed their offspring milk. And so, basically, that's a common trait among all mammals. They can basically survive in almost any condition in any environment in the world. From the day, from the crushing depths, like I said, of the ocean floor, like the Mariana Trench, all the way to the freezing temperatures of Antarctica. These include bears, bats, whales, dolphins, cows, kangaroos, platypi, elephants, mice, even humans are considered mammals. So basically anything that's really covered in fur. Fun fact, some poisonous mammals. Yes, you heard that right. Poisonous mammals. We are, humans are not poisonous animals. Pretty, pretty sure. Some poisonous mammals can include the duck-billed platypus. They have little, like, claws. So they have like a little claw. Hold on. I have this little Lego piece right here. If you could see it, it's like a little claw thing. So basically in their hands, they have that little claw thing right here on the back, on their, on the back of their wrist. So when they go like that to attack animals, they use that claw perfectly. Some other ones include the Solenodon, which I have no idea what it is, and the Water Shrew, which I'm guessing can bite and can do poison. <sighs> I'm tired right now. Let's just move on to the announcements. I'm not going to do the clap that you guys like a lot. Oh boy, I really need to sit down. Where can I sit down? Uh, I'm trying to find a chair. Hold on. Be right back. My chair's over there. I have to move the entire table. I don't feel like moving the table right now. All right, Whew. we're done with that. Next episode will be much shorter, so don't worry. I think it's about six, seven terms next quarter, next episode. But like I said at the beginning for announcements, so let's start the announcements. At the beginning of the video, I said we are starting a new game series. The game is called, where can I point to? This one, Turmoil. The game is called Turmoil. We are expected, I should stop throwing that in the air. We are expected to start this game, if my calendar is correct, about November 27th, since I upload every two other every other week now. The next topic, the next topic for the next episode is 
human body systems. My my fake plants are falling everywhere. Just there we go. Human body systems. So the immune system, digestive system, respiratory, circular, immunity. We'll talk about all those next week, next next episode. So yeah. That's the end. I'm gonna go take a break because I think I've deserved it after a long time. See you next week. Bye, see you next week. I didn't mean see you next week. I mean see you next, next video. Bye.